uh, continuing on now to, uh, to slides. And I will mercifully unpin my video. Okay. Uh, so here we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I'm going to, uh, I would refer you to uh, slides which have been posted for this session if you'd like to follow along there. So I'm going to be talking about um, state space and uh, speaking about a concept that I, I only mumbled about originally, which is this notion of distinguishing nominal dimensionality from intrinsic dimensionality. And we're going to talk about how we can use time series to reconstruct state space um, or an approximation thereof in ways that it can inform our modeling decisions. Okay, so just as a reminder, because we did cover this uh, in, in, in a brief fashion earlier, right? A, a state space provides this alternative way for depicting model evolution. Traditionally, we've relied a lot on time plots, uh, plots over time of, of system evolution. But a state space provides this other lens for examining the evolution of the system. And you recall, uh, if we have a model like this, uh, uh, we can create a state space where each axis of the state space corresponds to a particular element of state. Um, in ABMs, we'll see sort of summarized element of state. So S, for example, has a, has a coordinate associated with it. I has a coordinate and temporarily immune or, or you might call it temporarily recovered has an axis associated with it, right? And uh, what I'm showing on that slide there, showing the, the spiral is uh, a given trajectory, uh, which corresponds to a particular sort of run of the system, a particular realization of the system. And, and you know, it might start here with lots of susceptibles, few infectives and no one temporarily immune. And then as time goes on, it kind of think about a, a little marble rolling down. Well, that's, that's kind of weird, right? It rolls up. Um, uh, think about time going back. Well, okay, never mind. Um, so imagine this marble is, is shooting down here magnetically, driven by a magnetic force. And it, 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 it comes in and spirals in towards some equilibrium, right? Um, this, um, uh, this is a given run of the system. Time proceeds onwards. Uh, as I proceed down this trajectory. Um, and you can see that it's spiraling in. Um, time is implicit there. We could, if we wanted to label where we are at different times and it would be non-uniform. It's, like, it's not like we always go, you know, um, some defined amount uh, length along this every time. No, 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 it may dwell for a while here, but then it picks up and it starts going like gangbusters. Um, now, for a, a nonlinear model, we may have different uh, behavior obtaining, and and uh, we'll see later in this course, particularly uh, different basins of attraction, where there may be different equilibria that apply for different regions of it. But I want to draw your attention to the state space portrait. You've encountered it before; it should be at least pretty familiar to you, even if it's, you know, not quite as familiar as plots of say number of infectives over time, which you know, you've also seen a lot. And I noted that, you know, equilibria here lie at certain places where all derivatives are zero. And I noted uh, earlier that these equilibria fall into a couple of different categories. And this is where I'm paying off some of that proverbial tech debt. Um, uh, we didn't have time to, to mention this in any depth, but today I'm going to do a little bit, cover it a little bit more. So um, sometimes you get uh, an equilibrium where everything is flowing into it. It's just sucking things into it. Um, sometimes uh, it's pushing things out from it. It's like a quasar shooting out, you know, matter in, in all directions. The source is like a, um, excuse me, the sink is like a, um, a black hole. Uh, there can be a quasar that's that's shooting stuff out, um, and there can be mixed flows where it's sucked in in one dimension and shot out in other directions. Think about kind of a pulsar for those who are astronomy buffs. Um, and any of these can be kind of direct in linear ways, or it can also have a circular flow. For example, this is with a circular flow into a sink. It's sucking it in here 
into this vortex. And it's doing so with this spiral that indicates an imaginary component of, of the eigenvalues, it turns out. Um, you can also get, in really interesting ways, uh, limit cycles. Um, for example, these sorts of limit cycles. This is from a, uh, uh, an ecological example, the Vanderhoff uh, model uh, associated with uh, predators and prey. And if you approach it from the inside, it spirals out until you're on this outer trajectory. So you might think, for example, uh, hairs along the x-axis and links along the y-axis. And you get these cycles out of it that should look somewhat familiar for those who are pursuing assignment two, um, even though this is a different model in its details. Um, uh, you should get cycles where you know the prey go up and uh, as prey go up, uh, eventually the predators start to go up and that starts bringing prey down, but it can only go on so long and the jig is up and predators start to decline in numbers and that lays the groundwork for the prey to resume, right? Um, so these limit cycles will cycle around. There's actually an, an equilibrium in the center here uh, where it's totally imbalanced, but this limit cycle is kind of a dynamic equilibrium where it zips around it. And what's interesting is if you start it outside of this uh, limit cycle, it'll be sucked into the limit cycle. Start inside it, it will zoom out to it. So it, it, it sucks it into to the limit cycle as limiting behavior. Um, and uh, this sort of um, uh, equal, uh, sort of dynamic equilibrium, uh, equilibrium right around a point is not that uncommon. And it's called this, this limit cycle. Um, and we can use eigenvalues and eigenvectors to sort of recognize the, uh, the, the types of these. So for example, a source, which is flowing out in all directions along all eigenvectors, it's kind of natural directions. Um, uh, the real parts of all eigenvalues would be greater than zero. It will just be you know, expanding. Um, so for example, associated with uh, a state of a disease-free equilibrium, which is unstable, it may be shooting out along its eigenvalues uh, here, which reflect you know, more and more people getting infected. A sink um, could flow in along all its eigenvalues. And you can see one here. This is another sink uh, shown with this uh, perception, um, first order delay, perception delay, a delayed First order delay. I'm uh, sorry, a two, yeah, uh, a delay target follower type of construct where there's a delay in perception about where you are. This is like driving on an icy road. You overshoot, you overshoot, you overcompensate, and you kind of fishtail around. It's it's like that. Um, so it spirals in. This is a sink that has a spiral component, and and that's associated well. Um, uh, with all real parts of the eigenvalue being less than zero, but it has a imaginary component that spirals around it. It leads it to kind of go circularly. Uh, there can be a saddle point where it sucks in and shoots out and spiral if there's an imaginary component. And then you get these limit cycles if you have eigenvalues that are purely Im imaginary. They're, they're stable, li stable limit cycles. Um, that uh, have purely imaginary components. They're not sucking in towards the inner equilibrium that lies at the center. They're not pushing out, they're rather stable. And this actually is, is not purely that because there is this driving out and driving in depending on whether you're inside or outside the limit cycle. Uh, this is another sink uh, where we don't have um, uh, imaginary components with it, I believe, uh, but this one we do have imaginary. Uh, okay, so so we have these equilibria, and the equilibria, equilibria give signatures uh, in terms of their eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which describe the behavior right around that equilibria. And you can get these intriguing geometric, you know, uh, flows associated with them. And all these things lead to, of course, behavior over time, which we observe. It's just the corresponding state space often gives a more compelling portrait of what's going on um, in terms of the behavior than does just looking at graphs of many outputs simultaneously. Um, okay, um, so in the context of nonlinearity, which has been our focus for a while now, 
um, outcomes are typically path dependent. How you got there will determine what, what happens uh, from um, going forward. Often that ends up being incorporated in state. In, in state. Um, you can have multiple basins of attraction with different equilibria. You might have a source over here, or a sink over there, or a spiral for a limit cycle over here. Um, and where one starts is often a key determinant for future evolution. So for example, in a system like that, and we'll see this exact example in one of the lectures uh, later in this course, um, we might have um, a system where we have too few healthcare workers uh, and enough initial infectives, excuse me, we, uh, in this case, right, we have, we have enough initial infectives that it goes to an endemic equilibrium. We can't extinguish it. Uh, think US COVID-19. Um, uh, here, uh, think uh, New Zealand uh, COVID-19 or Australia COVID-19 or China or Taiwan or Korea um, COVID-19, where there was enough action taken early on, basically the, uh, the infection goes uh, extinct uh, uh, as, a, as a practical matter. And here, we're in a different uh, part of the equilibria, um, excuse me, a different part of state space, a different basin of attraction. In one place, we go to this point, that's the attractor. In another case, we go down here, which is the disease for equilibrium and it dies out. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to double check this sort of point. Um, uh, and I, I really should have shown this for exactly the same model, but basically, uh, it'll be corresponding to one, this is one base of attraction, this is another. This will pull down, this will pull up. Much as, you know, they say that the Columbia ice fields in um, uh, the Ice Fields Parkway and, and Banff Jasper National Park, uh, you know, within a very short distance of each other, the water runs variously to the Pacific, to the Arctic, to Hudson Bay. And if you go just if, like, a few kilometers from there, I think um, there may be a place that actually goes to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, okay, um, yeah, so this is from the same model and you could see it going in different directions. So here we have, you know, a situation where um, there's uh, different equilibria that are present, but each of them serve a certain base of attraction. And what's really intriguing here, and it should be familiar to you for our discussion of vaccination is there's these tipping points, right? And if we're here initially, just a little bit more effort, um, excuse me, if we were here originally, a little bit more effort could have brought us down and prevented it from happening. And instead we're picking up the pieces for a long time because we didn't have enough, uh, we had too many infectives per healthcare worker to, uh, to deliver care in a timely enough fashion and it spirals out of control. And there's a lot of cases like this where a stitch in time saves nine and where there's lock-in effects, there's effects that if a system starts here, it goes off to a state where you're, you know, you're in, in a really adverse way for a long time that ends up costing a lot more than if the infection could just have been under control. And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, for COVID-19, as some of our modeling has shown to colleagues in Australia and colleagues across Canada, the truth is that, um, well, you know, parties making decisions about these things are often given to very short term thinking. Um, you know, we got to open up sooner to prevent the, the damage on businesses, which is a sentiment, you know, I, I understand has some, um, some genuine uh, concerns that are very real associated with it. Often what you find is that um, when it comes to lock in effects, um, uh, you know, if you don't have time to do it right, you don't have time to do it wrong. And the amount of time that you have to spend under lockdown is far, far less if you deal with it up front in a straightforward way and you get on top of it than if you, you know, open up early and you end up dealing with the consequences and having to re lockdown later. The actual amount of time that you spend under lockdown is much later um, than if you had nipped it in the bud early on. And some countries accomplish that. Um, but it's a lesson that hasn't been fully internalized either in Canada or I might add in this fair province. Um, 
but it's it's a lesson from complex systems. These lock-in effects um, are often devilishly hard to reverse, but if you can prevent them in the first case by bringing things into disease-free equilibria, you'll often save a huge amount of grief and often a, a huge amount of treasure, um, huge amount of economic costs, huge amount of of uh, needless uh, waste of, of, of effort as well. Um, it's a key lesson and applies in countless areas of life. Uh, think uh, drug addiction, for example, think cycles of poverty. There are some things we can do, for example, in childhood, heading off adverse childhood experiences, heading off poverty that, that um, comparatively cheap, but, uh, but means that other parts of the system are not gonna, um, are not going to be uh, picking up the pieces for decades from now. The problem is we're dealing with a context, ladies and gentlemen, worldwide, we're dealing with mindsets that are siloed and where the costs borne to the criminal justice system or to the social system are considered separate from the costs borne to the health system and separate yet from those born to the educational system. And so the resources that as it were um, uh, are cheapest overall by far um, often cannot be mustered because they're trapped in these siloed areas. Um, and uh, this often ends up really shortchanging what can be accomplished. Um, and this comes out of complex systems and the theories of complex systems with lock-in effects um, that uh, these very localized decisions, these very greedy decisions from an algorithmic standpoint can end up having uh, all sorts of disproportionately negative consequences. And as one colleague of mine puts it, if you don't have time to do it right, why do you always think you have time to do it wrong? Okay, so um, one thing that, that does come out of this though is an interesting phenomenon, which uh, will presage what we're gonna be talking about in a few minutes. Um, with respect to, to uh, these sorts of uh, dynamics on state space, we introduce these with, um, with models, uh, which are, for example, some of which are shown here. Um, and this model nominally is a three-dimensional model. We have S, we have I, and we have R. We have three components of state, right? Um, but, and, and, you know, looking at it, state space, um, there it is, a three-dimensional state space, right? Uh, it's a three-dimensional structure. Um, we have uh, this axis, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, right? Um, but the truth is, look a little bit deeper. If you take that same image and you look at it from the side, this is what you'll see. Flat as a plane, ladies and gentlemen. Flat as a plane. Um, if you look at it from the right angle, you'll find it's actually two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. And uh, this is going to provide us with some opportunities for discussion because, and uh, I wish I had the, the slide here, I'd probably kick into it right away, because not always do we need the full extent of this space to represent all the information. Not always do we need uh, all three dimensions uh, to represent a system with three state variables. There can be symmetries, there can be conservation properties, and there can be the intrinsic dynamics of coupling with the system that lowers its effective dimensionality from the nominal dimensionality to a dimensionality that's far, far lower. We'll come back to this point. But first, I want to talk about a motivating example, which brings us home to our module in this class. And that is the issue of agent-based models. You could be excused for wondering why to this point, whilst I've harked back to, uh, to my recurrent favorites um, uh, in terms of uh, these models of aggregate system dynamics and character, why I haven't yet talked about ABMs because I wanted to build up understanding. I wanted to remind you, I wanted to build up a, a point of reference before I throw you into the deep end with ABMs. Here's the issue, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe you could riddle me this, speak on in the chat or speak out in, in a stentorian voice, if you'd like. 
suppose we have three agents within a population and each agent can be in one of two possible states. Let's suppose uh, susceptible or infective, okay? Three agents, Sam, Mary, Sue, and each of them can be in either susceptible or infective. How many possible states of the system as a whole are there? Anyone? How many possible configurations of the system there are? How many different possibilities are there for the current state of the system? If I had to say, what's the current state? Um, how many different possibilities are there for that? Two to the three? Yes, it's two to the three. Think of it as encoding, you know, that each of them is described by a bit, right? True or false. We have three bits, right? Um, one for Sam, one for Sue, and one for Mary. And for a computer scientist, that should positively invite, positively scream at you, you know, the fact that you have eight possibilities. You have three bits, right? Um, uh, so in this case, we have two to the three. Each agent had two possibilities, two possible states it could be in, and there were three agents. In general, we have the number of states that each agent can be in, call it S, and we have a number of agents, call it N. And the number of possibilities across all agents, across the entire model is S to the N power. Now that rises pretty quick, right? Think if you didn't have three agents, you had 10 agents, you'd have two to the 10, which I hope you know is 1024. If you add 16 agents, you'd have 65,536, right? Um, if you had 1,000 agents, well, okay, I, I can't recite that to you. It would take the rest of the time um, of the lecture. So uh, this rises very, very quickly. It rises combinatorially. We have two for Sam times two for Mary times two for Sue, right? Um, and so if you think about depicting state space for an agent-based model, it's a, in, in, in its strict form, ladies and gentlemen, it's a fool's error, right? You're not going to be able to, um, uh, to, to completely summarize it. Um, uh, and so instead, what you need to do is uh, think about approximations to state space. Think about approximations in the form of summary measures across the model. So maybe we won't have a separate dimension for Sam, for his possibilities, a separate for Sue and a separate for Mary. Um, and we, we have an ungodly number of those things. Uh, but instead, maybe we'll, we'll have a summary state space where we have the number of infectives, the number of susceptibles, the number of recovered, where we again abstract over who particularly is infected. Right? Um, we're just counting up. Now, this is not a complete state space. Any given point there is not going to tell us uniquely uh, Sam is infected and Mary and Sue are not, or you know, it's Mary is infected and Sam and Sue are not. Um, but it will give us a summary measure that can often be quite instructive. And it'll be especially instructive once we consider the, um, the intrinsic dimensionality. Um, uh, of the state space. Okay, um, so uh, a further complication here is that agent-based um, uh, agent based models are typically stochastic and uh, they are, they're going to exhibit some just variability due to stochastic. So they won't look quite as nice as this, that's for sure. They'll have be kind of jagged in their depiction. But a key point that we'll come back to is that nominally, we have S to the N possibilities for the different agents. And you think that's an ungodly number. It is ungodly number. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a horrendous number, a heinously large number for, for decent sized numbers of, of agents for even a very modest uh, agent-based model. But here's the deal. 
just as I told you with aggregate models, if there, because of there's coupling within the model, because of the intrinsic dynamics, for example, in this case, um, the fact that you're not going to have anyone dying and no one coming in. Um, in other cases, it may be the number of infectives is so highly tied up with the number of hospitalized people, they're essentially the same. There's no use keeping them as separate axes. Often we have a lot smaller a dimensionality than we think. And, and often we're only occupying a, a thin, as it's called, manifold, a thin sort of slice through this space. Okay, um, here's a here's an age-based model um, that is one of those I provided to you. You can go download it from Moodle. So this is a predator-prey model with lynxes and hares inspired, inspired by the records of the Hudson Bay Company out of Canada's north, I think predominantly Manitoba, maybe some into Saskatchewan, uh, where we have lynx, the red, and hares, the green. This is a large space. And the lynxes are pursuing the hares over this space. Um, uh, and you can alter the initial states and assumptions. And you get out, you can get out depending on the parameter values, you know, dynamics, which should remind those of you pursuing assignment two, a little bit of what you see in coming out of that model, even though that model was a, a, uh, an aggregate system dynamics model. Here we have lynxes in red and hares in green. But what I've done shown in the bottom is shown a, uh, a characterization of this where we have hares along the x-axis and we have lengths along the y-axis, okay? Um, and what's interesting is that you get these spirals around certain points. I think in this case, and I'm gonna to have to check, I may have changed the parameter values partway through, but you'll notice the system is cycling around some points here in this summary space. The number of hairs does not uniquely specify, uh, you know, if you give a, a certain value for numbers of hairs and a certain value for numbers of links, that does not uniquely specify the space. There's a huge number of different possibilities for particular geometric configurations in the space that all boil down to being at this point in the summary state space, this projected state space, projecting down from a very high dimension to a lower dimension, much as we might project down a light onto a piece of paper with a shadow. We project down, you know, the shape of my finger or the shape of this, uh, you know, of this, uh, this thermos onto this piece of paper with that, uh, with that shadow. Here we projected down into a lower dimensional space. The paper was essentially two dimensional, but it projected down the shape of a three dimensional object onto it, into those two dimensions. And here we've, you know, uh, folded down a gigantic state space of, of uh, enormous number of dimensions into two dimensions, but we see a recognizable structure. We see a structural spiraling. And in fact, we see that in the emergent values. Um, this is from an SIR model um, that uh, uh, I will be providing to you. Um, we'll probably discuss it more next time, but uh, uh, this is uh, for, for SIR. And you should recognize that this looks kind of, uh, uh, oh, by the way, sorry, SIRS. Oh my gosh, SIR uh, would die out, right? Um, SIRS, and this should remind you slightly of this. This is from this SIRS model too. It's kind of like we're spiraling around this point. We're never totally settling down because in an HMA's model, there's always what that prevents us from settling down. Speak on, use. Nice. There's noise. There's there's stochastics, so we're we're kind of um, hopping around this because we're never totally uh, settling down, and and so we spiral around that point, but we're never going very far. I mean, look at this. This is like from 300 to 460 on the one hand, and from like 40 up to 200 or something, but. But we're never going, and this is a population, I think, of a uh, thousand, a thousand uh, here total. Um, so, uh, 
you know, here uh, I've actually had a more articulated model here with multiple socioeconomic groups, people differing by incomes. And you can kind of see for low SES groups and high SES groups, they're in different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, points in state space. They circle around because of higher crowding, for example, or, or uh, other effects, you may get differences. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually with somewhat different original population sizes and number of infection counts, lower income tend to have, have more infections. This is uh, uh, a gradient. Uh, I'll be introducing this model next time. We have income going to the right here. We place people into networks according to their income where people at higher income have fewer neighbors. People at lower incomes are crowded and the infection tends to stay there. It tends to, to crowd disproportionately. This is the number of infections they've suffered thus far in the model. And you could see lower, lower income people, this kind of tan, um, tend to have disproportionately more infections than the high income people here. So the lower income people due to crowding have a lot more infections um, that, that stick with them. Um, uh, okay, um, now you recall this distinction though, I argued that just as we can boil these things down to two dimensions in a rough way, um, often we're not losing that much. Um, just as we can take uh, nominally three-dimensional uh, state space here, um, we can boil it down into two dimensions. Um, and those two dimensions will retain all the information here. Uh, in this case, because of uh, conservation, you're either an S or I or R. If you leave R, you're going back to S. So, uh, you know, they, they total up to the to the same same number. So it's a intrinsically two dimensional, nominally three dimensional. And ladies and gentlemen, our world is filled with these sorts of things. Let's take this sheet of paper again, right? Um, nominally, the sheet of paper is in three dimensional space. And you can see it even has a bit of cur curvature that I've, I've added to it. Um, but, you know, intrinsically it's space it's, its dimensionality is very, very close to two dimensions. Uh, it, it isn't taking advantage of the three, the full three dimensions. Um, if I were to show you, you know, a, um, uh, you know, an object like this, this pencil uh, or this stylus, um, this is a pencil as well. Uh, you know, these are, uh, these are essentially one dimensional structures embedded in three dimensional points or even better yet, this cord, right? There's a one dimensional structure embedded in three dimensions. This is a two dimensional structure embedded in three dimensions. Um, so we often make this distinction between the nominal dimensionality of something, uh, the naive dimensionality. You know, we have S, I, and R. Lo and behold, two dimensions. And the intrinsic dimensionality, this is the dimensionality that it actually exercises. Um, and often, and this is the key, and it's a key for agent-based models, the intrinsic dimensionality is far less than the nominal dimensionality. Um, and uh, here we have from three to two, but it turns out that often we have this in spades for agent-based models. And why do we have it? Well, I listed three, three reasons there. One is symmetry. Um, there's a certain symmetry of the situation that limits the number of possibilities. Um, for example, a pipe is radially symmetric. And um, really all you have to do is, is figure out you know, how things differ along it and going out uh, the other dimension, it's, it's entirely symmetric. Um, uh, there's conservation properties. S plus I plus R have to total up to something. And if we lose S, we get I. And if we lose R, we get S. Um, so there's conservation and that lowers the number of dimensions. But often of profound significance is coupling because ladies and gentlemen, we are not solitudes. People are not islands to themselves when it comes to something like the spread of an infectious disease. And the state that Sam is in, if he's infected, it actually 
it it's going to be hard to keep under wraps. And it, if Sue is not currently infected, she still soon will be if she's Sam's best buddy. Uh, and Mary uh, will will tend to get it as well because of coupling, because of linkages between different individuals, whether it's due to behaviorally or um, you know imitative behavior or in terms of spread of pathogen or attitudinally. Um, we are not living in a situation where each agent is independent of the others. They are tangled together and it's of the nature of complex systems to have this deep tangling, this coupling between different areas of a system. Um, what's going on over in the recovered compartment is gonna affect what's gonna go on in the susceptible compartment or the affected compartment. Uh, what goes around comes around here. Um, and what goes on in the lynx population is going to affect the hair population. What goes on in hairs, if there's a big drop off of hairs, it's going to be felt in lynxes. It's the nature of these complex systems that they are coupled. Um, and uh, typically, this is a very tight coupling over time because these are dynamic systems. Their evolution depends on the current state of the system and not just the evolution of how many people get infected depends, how many susceptible people get infected depends not just on the characteristics of the susceptibles, but how many infectives there are. So there's this entangling going on within these systems. And I'd like to show this. So, so here we have a little uh, set of dynamics. Uh, I, I have a couple of dynamics here. X depends on X, yeah, but it depends on Y. And Y depends on itself, but it depends on X as well. Um, now, nominally, this may look like it is a dimension two, right? We have X's and we have Y's, and each of them can evolve dynamically. And in fact, it's a nonlinear system, right? Um, but if you think about it, there's something else going on here that's pretty intriguing. Watch this. So take focus in on this equation. The rate of change of x equals alpha x minus beta times x y. Great. So you may say, well, you know, okay, to determine how x is going to change, we have to know y. And, and if you look, there's kind of almost symmetric, uh, uh, not, not exactly symmetric, but similar thing with y, right? Y depends on itself and, and x. And so you might think, well, to know one, you have to know the other, but but watch this. Okay, so take that first thing and we can rearrange it, right? Oh, we only have one Y here. So I'm gonna solve for Y. I'm gonna rearrange this and I'm gonna bring, you know, things around. So I'm gonna bring the beta X Y over to one side uh, and I'm gonna have alpha X minus X dot, the rate of change of X uh, over here. Treating the rate of change of X is just some some, some value as well. Uh, so uh, I know that this has to occur at any one point, X and Y, this has to obtain. If I know the rate of change of X and I know X and I know Y, um, sorry, and, and, and I know I know X and I know alpha beta, um, this, this has to obtain. So I could solve for Y. I'm just dividing through by beta X, right? And what this is saying is, look, Y is, Y is identical to the value of alpha x minus the rate of change of x all over beta x. And you'd say that, well, that's weird. That's weird. Okay, so at any one time, the value of y is given by these values only depending on x. And look, it's the same thing for x. x the value for x at any one time is given totally by the value for y. What that should be telling you is that the two are coupled, they're tangled, they're, they're they're so tightly coupled that knowing one, including the derivative of it, will tell us the other. They, they, you know, one gives us all the information it needs about the other because they depend on one another. And, you know, for the example you did for your assignment or some of you are pursuing now, if you think about it, you know, this, this applies, right? Look, um, uh, knowing the number of gophers, if you know the number of gophers right now is dropping rapidly, 
it's possibly yelling at you something about the number of coyotes that are around, right? Um, there's got to be quite a few to be eating those gophers. So instead of the gopher population going up at rate alpha, it's at, at birth rate alpha, it's, it's going down. That tells us there's got to be a lot of coyotes around, right? Um, and look, if, if the coyotes are, are rising rapidly, the only way they're going to be rising rapidly is if there's a lot of gophers for them to eat, right? Um, so knowing about the rate of change of state variables tells us a lot about what's going on elsewhere in the system, but particularly other coupled areas. Uh, I did this for West Nile. We have models of West Nile in this province uh, spread via mosquitoes. We have humans and mosquitoes. And you can make a, a similar argument there that you have birds as well. And there's this whole bird mosquito um, amplification cycle where birds are the, um, the reservoir species for West Nile. Mosquitoes pick it up from birds and mosquitoes give it to birds. And then it brings it down to humans and uh, and people have to go to the hospital um, in, in some cases. But look, uh, the, the thing that's outlandish about this is if you have a coupled system, what this is saying is that, you know, what's going on in one piece of the system is completely in sync with what's going on with, with other pieces of the system. They're similar, if, if we have data from the world it, it's going to show some features of this, okay? Um, so, so empirical data from the world about X is going to tell us about Y, a different feature in the system on which we may not have data, on which we may not have direct data. Maybe we only have direct data on X, but X's data is going to whisper to us about Y. If we only have data on gophers, because they're easy to, to categorize, it will whisper to us about what's going on with, with coyotes. Um, and using just you know one observation, its rate of change will be whispering to us about the other parts of the system. And in fact, this is proved, proven in the early 1980s by a uh, Dutch mathematician, um, Flemish mathematician, I think, um, uh, Flores Takens. Um, and basically what he showed is on a broad set of issues. If you have a coupled nonlinear system, a couple dynamic system. I don't even think it has to be not linear. Um, using just a single time series of data from that system on any one piece of that system, you can reconstruct the broader system that's driving it. So all you you have to go through what's called delay embedding. So if we have a time series y, for each point y, each time t, we create a vector that consists of y of t and y as it was some amount of time tau ago and y as it was two tau ago. Um, and you, you create this, this vector. So, so for each point in time, we, we create a vector um, which is lagged. Uh, it has these lag components, the current value, what as it was some amount of time before then twice as far back as that. Um, and you can do it for, you know, just a pair or, or, or triple or quadruple. And um, it turns out that this allows us to peer into the structure of the state space of the system. So if we have Y in observation, um, let's take this observation, which happens to be called Y here. This is an observation over time from a nonlinear system called the Lorenz attractor. It's a couple nonlinear differential equation system. And this is a set of observations from it. And you could say that looks totally random and you could be excused for saying that because it looks random, but it's not random. It's chaotic. It's not random, it's, it's actually, there's order there. There's an orderliness to it. There's a regularity to it if you use the right lens. So take Y and we do this reconstruction for each point in time, we create a vector of the value there of this, the value as it was some number of time units ago and the value twice as far back as that, okay? Um, and 
it turns out we can reconstruct the underlying state space by so doing. And I give an example here, and this model is provided to you. Uh, it's on the Moodle site. So um, here, all we're looking at, so this is, the, this is the state space. If you knew truly what was going on in the system, you know, it has three variables, X, Y, and Z. If you knew X, Y, and Z, you could plot out each on a graph, right? You could plot out X against Y. You could plot out X against Z, and you could plot out X, uh, Y against Z, right? Um, and you'd get pictures like this. Uh, these are projections down of a three-dimensional state space into, into these. And, and this is nothing fancy. This is, this is if we had measurements and all these things. But here's the thing. If you only have measurement on one, and here I make it, I only have measurement on X. I can do this delay embedding, put this delay embedding in place, and get out, I'll put X, versus x at t minus tau. All I'm doing is I'm graphing out, you know, for some variable, the current value versus the value tau go, right? Um, great. Um, I plot that out and I, I see this. See that, wait a minute, that looks familiar. Um, yeah, well, it, it looked, looked familiar um, because it turns out that it's this, it's the same thing. Um, so if you plot out the value from any one of these, it against its delayed component, it will give you a representation of dynamics across multiple variables of the system, such as uh, this one here. And you can do this systematically and uh, you will end up finding that if you do this with three such measurands, um, X, x at t minus tau and x at t minus two tau, you will get out something that looks like this, which has a very odd similarity to this because it is this, just stretched in some sort of odd way, stretched and kind of twisted. Um, so what am I saying? I'm saying what, with one observation from this entire system over time, observing one thing from it, think, you know, observing for COVID-19 hospitalizations, let's say, or observing deaths, you know, just, just deaths. Um, we could actually go through, process it, embed it in this way, look at the value now, the value as it was tau ago, two taus ago, and I could then plot it out in three-dimensional space. So X of T, X of t minus tau and x of t minus two tau. And I would get a depiction of the state space that is driving COVID-19 over time in our fair province, no less, of Saskatchewan. Now, similarly for gophers and hares, we could depict out the state space that are drive that is of the system that's driving gophers and hares with only observations about gophers. Or we could figure out the state space that's driving West Nile across birds, across, um, across uh, mosquitoes and humans by plotting out the number of human cases over time. Now there's limits to this, uh, but it's a very effective technique. And just to give you a, a, a sense of this, um, for example, this is a model with SIR structure associated with it, plotted out in this lagged embedding fashion. So one of these is X of T, that X is X minus of T minus tau. So uh, the current value in the first X is the value tau time steps ago in the second, and the third axis has the value as it was two, two of those tau ago. Um, so maybe tau is a week and one is the current value, one is as it was a week ago, one is as it was two weeks ago. You take this and let's, this is a system which generate with SEIR and you get, because of stochastics, a bit of a ball. This is SEIR. This is purely from empirical data on a single variable that was observed, let's say hospitalization. Um, in other words, that single variable contains information. It whispers about the broader system. 
it contains information about many pieces of the system that drive it, not just about that piece. Why? Because they are coupled. And because if we know gophers, we know some, if we know what's going on with gophers and they're dropping like a stone, we know there's got to be coyotes around, lots of them. And if we know coyotes are growing like gangbusters, there's got to be the gophers to feed them. Um, because in a coupled system and dynamical systems, which are coupled, knowing about one piece whispers to you about what's going on in the other pieces. And you can do this from empirical data and get some really interesting insights. This is from experimental data from uh, wearable sensors uh, collected in our lab, for example. Um, and uh, it turns out there's all sorts of details with this. You have to pick your towel carefully. What dimension you want to embed it in is important. Um, uh, picking your towel will kind of transform it. To small a towel, you get sort of a linear form. You transform it up. You can get something that's, that's more indicative. Um, and, um, and it turns out that this embedded space has all sorts of great um, great opportunities associated with it. You can recognize hidden order. You can visually assess dimensionality, the connectedness of it. Um, you can understand something about whether the data is plausible um, to match with an SIR model or SEIR. Does it have the, the requisite structure um, to, to match uh, one versus the other? Um, the dimensionality will, will whisper to you how many state variables might you need under the right circumstances. Turns out that there's prediction methods that are based on state space reconstruction because you can, one of the best ways to predict what a system is going is if you can characterize its state space um, and you can characterize elements of its state space with this method with one measure in. And you can, um, uh, you can assess, it turns out, uh, causal influence of one variable on another. Um, time is out and I need to beat a fast retreat across town uh, to pick up a family member. Um, but I hope that this, uh, this brief foray into state spaces, reacquainting ourselves, uh, looking at how it engages with empirical data and looking at how it implies to to uh, ABMs where we're dealing with summaries, summary state spaces, projected state spaces that reflect summaries of a system, um, not uniquely identifying with one point net, not uniquely identifying system state, but identifying um, a, a, a set of those states, an equivalence class of those states that map to the same summary, um, that that will give you some clues as to tools you might use, lenses those of you pursuing projects might use for understanding the dynamics of your systems. These are advanced topics and its later components. Uh, I certainly don't ex expect you to, to understand all their ins and outs, but they point to us, point us to some, for some very rich empirically, um, you know, empirically informed understandings that can be leveraged to shape our models and to challenge our models. Just as we challenge our models by trying to match them with data over time, we can try to examine the state space of a model and compare it to what we see for the reconstructed state space from um, external world data. Okay, that's all we have time for today. I will post to Moodle when I'm back in the seat so that we can uh, have, cof uh, have coffee hours. We can have office hours, hopefully, uh, between now and one. Thank you very much, uh, traffic willing. Thanks. Take care there, and I hope to see some of you in office.